Before I begin my sermon, I want to give a footnote. Um, I have allergies. And guess what kind of allergy I have? And guess what it does to me? It, it shuts my throat down. And guess what I do for a living? <laughs> now, I, I said to the early service, I don't know why the Easter lily is a symbol of Easter. He was raised from the dead. Well, if you had a chance to look at my sermon title, you might be intrigued. An Easter message older than the Gospels. You might be even say to yourself, how can this be? How can we have an Easter message older than the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? I'm referring to an oral tradition that has been handed down from one person to another, going all the way back to the eyewitness. Paul says as much in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul is arguing against a group of people who do not believe in the resurrection of the body. Uh, scholars believe this is a form of Gnosticism. The Gnostics believe that you're saved by uh, belief in Jesus and others' knowledge or gnosis. That's where you get the understanding of Gnostics. But part of that special knowledge is that the body is evil. If it's not evil, it is certainly a big burden. And so, in the Gnostics' way of thinking, they would never affirm the resurrection of the body. And so, Paul is letting the, Car the Christians at Corinth know that if we do not believe in the resurrection of the body, that our belief is in vain. And he goes on to say, if you really don't believe me, believe in the tradition that is older than me. And the tradition that Paul cites is one that has been handed down to him. It begins at verse 3 and ends at verse 7 of chapter 15. The tradition that has been handed down to even Paul is this. And Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. You might ask yourself, what Scriptures are they referring to? Well, scholars believe it would be Isaiah 53, which speaks of the suffering servant. Jesus would say that the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. The suffering servant in Isaiah is one who suffers on behalf of God's people in order to redeem God's people. So, the first Christians, when they trying to put together that Jesus died for sins according to the Scriptures, what Scriptures? And they came across Isaiah 53 regarding the suffering servant. See for yourself as I begin at verse 4 of chapter 53, if it does not describe what happened to Jesus. Surely He has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. Yet we accounted Him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But He was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon Him was the punishment that made us whole, and by His bruises we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on Him the iniquity of us all. The received tradition goes on to say, and He was buried. You might say to yourself, well, that seems obvious. If someone dies, you bury them. And we know that Jesus was buried in a tomb provided by Joseph of Arathimea, according to the Gospels. And I invite you, if you've never had a chance to go to the Holy Land, to go. In many ways, it's called the fifth Gospel, 
The first four Gospels are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The fifth Gospel is the Holy Land. And it so happens that a British soldier after World War I was looking up and he saw in the rocks a skull. And he remembered the Gospels, how Jesus was crucified on Golgotha, the place of the skull. And he was thinking, this looks like it was a garden once. And so they excavated. And you know what they found? In this dry desert land around Jerusalem, you know what they found? Cisterns, huge cisterns, as big as these pews. It was enough to collect the water because the rainy season only happens three months of the year. Enough to collect and then be able to water. And you know what they did? They brought it back to life. And you can go to the garden tomb. You can see the place of the skull above. You can see the hewn out tombs. And you can see the rock that covers the entrance of the tomb. They're about two stories, maybe three stories big. It would take several people with a lever to move the stone. Yes, they wanted everyone to know that the one who died for sins was actually buried. The tradition goes on. And on the third day he was raised from the dead, according to the Scriptures. Now, you might ask yourself, what Scriptures are we speaking of? When it comes to the third day, they begin to think to themselves about the story of Jonah. How many days was Jonah in the belly of the fish? How many? Three. And on the third day, because God's work with Jonah was not finished, he had yet to preach a message of repentance to the Ninevites. Jonah finally says, yes, God, I'll do what you asked me to do. And a great fish coughs him up, and Jonah goes and preaches a message of repentance. He must have smelled really, really bad, because they believed him. Jesus was in the belly of the earth for three days, and his mission was not yet accomplished. He died for sins, but he wasn't yet raised for righteousness. He had not yet defeated the power of sin and death. And so on the third day, death could not hold him. His mission was not complete. But Jesus, unlike Jonah, Jesus is not the reluctant servant of God. He embraced his calling. And God raised him from the dead. And he appeared to Peter and to the twelve. And to five hundred people. Some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James. Then to the apostles, the one sent out. In effect, Paul is saying, if you don't believe me, believe in the eyewitnesses to the resurrection. And then Paul will add to this oral tradition that has been handed down to the very beginning. And he says, and lastly, he appeared to me. What does this mean? This means that Paul places his encounter with the risen Christ on par with all the others, with the oral tradition. Paul is saying that his encounter with the risen Christ on the road to Damascus when he saw a bright light and he was blinded and he only heard the voice from above. He is saying that my experience of the risen Christ is on par with Mary Magdalene who saw the risen Christ in the garden. He, she first thought he was a gardener, but when 
Jesus calls Mary by name. Her eyes are open, and she recognizes him. The two from Emmaus are walking back from Jerusalem to Emmaus, and they meet a stranger. And he opens up the scriptures and says why the Messiah must suffer and die. And they get to Emmaus, and he invites them in. And Jesus breaks bread, and their eyes are open. Paul is saying, my encounter with the risen Christ is the same as the others. And what is similar about all the resurrected appearances is this. First, they do not see Jesus or do not recognize Jesus. Then their eyes are open and they recognize Jesus, and then he disappears. But all of them are convinced that they've seen the risen Christ. What does this mean for us? It means that we too can encounter the risen Christ as Paul, that the oral tradition is not set in stone, that it continues. It continues to be handed down from one believer to the next who says, I have seen the Lord. He is risen. <laughs> Do you want to preach? <laughs> I have seen the risen Lord. He's risen. He is risen indeed. That's the tradition that is handed down. It's not dead. It's alive. And it can happen to you, with you. You can encounter the risen Christ just like Paul did on the road to Damascus, or as you get in your car and go for Easter dinner. And when you pass the bread, you can encounter the risen Christ. Come to think of it, when you pass the bread, your eyes can be open as the two from Emmaus was. The good news of Easter is too good to keep to ourselves. Thankfully, the women got over their fear and told the disciples what they saw and heard. According to the oral tradition, who were the first eyewitnesses? Peter and the Twelve. According to the Gospels, who were the first eyewitnesses? The women. The Gospels correct the oral tradition. It was thought that women were not reliable witness in a court of law, so I think in some ways that's why the oral tradition excludes them. But we see the Gospels correcting that oral tradition. And remember, who were the first witnesses? It was the women. And they got over their fear of what they saw. Have you ever been afraid to tell what you saw and have experienced because what might happen to you next? I'm reminded of a bad joke, but I'm going to tell it anyway. <laughs> a minister, as so happens, had an allergy towards lilies and decided that he would not attend Easter service. His throat was clogged up. And so he had the associate preach. And you know what he did? He went out and played golf. And you know what happened next? He got a hole in one. And you know what happened? He couldn't tell anyone. <laughs> God had the last word. I said it was a bad joke. <laughs> they got over the fear because the text says they were seized also with amazement. The good news of Easter is too good to keep to ourselves.
Let us get over our fear, our inhibitions of what others might think, and let us pass on this great tradition that has been handed down to us from the very beginning. He is risen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.